Okay, so we talked about in our previous lecture about how important boundary layers are towards dictating the characteristics of flow for immersed bodies. Uh, it's true too of internal flow, um, but with internal flow, things reach an equilibrium after a while. Pipes tend to be pretty long, right? So, um, but within things like valves and corners, boundary layers play a tremendously important role. Um, so we're going to look though now at laminar boundary layers first because they're simpler. Uh, and before we can do that, we need to talk about what a boundary layer is, what it looks like, and how it develops as it um, along an object. So let's assume here we have a flat plate moving through a uh, flat plate moving through a uniform flow here of with a speed u. Um, and if we were to look at velocity profiles along this plate, when we, if we started at the very beginning, um, if we start at the very beginning of the plate, what we would see is that the plate, uh, the velocity profile next to the plate is very steep. Um, we know that it has to be zero at the plate itself because of no slip condition. And we know that it eventually has to go to a free stream velocity of u and it does it very quickly. And then as we move farther along the plate, what we find out is that this region where the fluid is slowed down grows as we go along. And these are supposed to be straight up and down, by the way. <laughs> That's terrible drawing, terrible drawing. Um, yeah, it grows. And so if we draw it again here, it's gonna be even larger. like that. And if we were to connect the point at which the flow stops slowing down because of the plate, um, we would see that this forms a nice region of this boundary layer, if you will. Um, and that this, this distance here is called delta. That's the, that's the height of our boundary layer. Um, so this is all for a laminar boundary layer is all very clean as it happens, right? If you were to draw a streamline right next to the flow, it would spread out, right? Because it's slowing down, it has to move away. Um, but it would stay nice and clean as it went through. That happens a, until a point called the critical, critical length. Um, past this point, past this Reynolds, where the Reynolds number reaches a value of five times 10 to the fifth. Um, this is similar to the Reynolds number of 2100 for pipes, right? But obviously different because pipes are different than external flow. So it's not gonna have the same Reynolds number where things get um, more chaotic. Um, so at a critical Reynolds number of around five times 10 to the fifth, and you'll note the, Reynolds, uh, the significant digits that we used here, just one, so it's, there's quite a bit of wiggle room here, depending on the characteristics of the flow and the characteristics of the plate and everything like that. Um, but around this region, the flow starts to turn uh, transitional and the boundary layer grows significantly. And the reason it grows significantly is that the flow becomes much more chaotic and we have much more mixing. After that point, it grows slowly, it grows actually more slowly than um, in the uh, laminar section. And the flow here looks very different. So our flow profile, if we wanna draw an average flow profile, would look something like this. It's very steep and then goes up. This is almost like a parabola in the laminar region. In the turbulent region, it's much more, much more steep. And again, average flow would look something like this. But there's all kinds of turbulent flow, mixing going on exchanging slow layers with fast layers, which is why the, the flow is fairly homogeneous, has a, is nearly free stream velocity until you get very close to the plate. Because it's mixing so much, we don't have the ability to develop this beautiful stratified uh, velocity layer. Um, consequently, we have much higher shear stress here at the, at the, at the plate. Um, remember shear stress tau, is equal to mu du dy. And now this 
formula is only good for laminar flow. It's not actually good for turbulent flow, but it's still a useful. It's it's still useful, right? Um, because this, uh, if we look right at the plate here, this slope of the flow right at the plate is actually quite steep. So that means this is quite high, which means our shear stress is quite high. Um, we'll talk about the actual way of calculating shear stress with turbulent flow because there's additional terms you have to include as a result of the mixing that's occurring. Um, but again, we're going to talk about laminar flow today. I just want you to know what turbulent flows look like so that you can um, keep those in mind while we're talking about laminar flows. Great. Um, so I've drawn all this, but uh, there is a fantastic YouTube video that for um, a link to which I've posted on the UB Learns website. Go look at it. It's incredible. It was filmed in the 1960s, and there literally has not been anything better than it since it's been posted. Um, I'll probably watch it with you guys and comment on it uh, during one of the lectures coming up. Great. So uh, we can solve for we can solve for this height, this delta. By the way, this is still delta over here. Um, we define delta as 0 0.99 times the free stream velocity. Um, that really depends on how well you can know the fluid velocity period, right? When I was an undergrad whew, almost 20 years ago, um, actually this value was much more like delta is equal to 0 0.98. Um, and I saw even 9.6. If you go farther back in time, it becomes like 0 0.95, and even farther back, it's 0 0.90. And the reason is, is because our ability to measure the velocity of fluids has increased immeasurably since then. Not immeasurably, actually quite measurably. Quite. <laughs> Obviously, it has to be measurably. Otherwise, the whole point of experimentally measuring flow would be silly. Um, but we can, we can measure flow much more accurately, much more accurately than we used to. Um, obviously, with, a, with, a, with an uncertainty of near 1%, if we can define the boundary layer to within 1%. And we can also use computational um, simulations, uh, um, which we know the velocity of those perfectly, right? Great. So um, we, what we want, one of our goals is to determine the thickness of this boundary layer determine the thickness of this boundary layer. And we want to be able to solve for the forces on a plate because ultimately, right, in order for this stuff to be useful, we have to be able to predict the behavior of physical systems. And a lot of times what we care about is drag or, or lift, but drag with a flat plate like this. So we can always start with Navier-Stokes equation in 2D, in this case, with conservation of mass. And we can simplify it. Um, so the first question we have to ask ourselves is what do we know about u versus v? What do we know about the u velocity versus the v velocity? And it turns out that while we do have some v velocity, while we do have some flow in the y direction, you see the streamline is slowly moving up because the flow is slowing down so it has to spread out. Um, we do have some v velocity. v, our, u, our y component of our velocity, is much, much less than our u component. And so if we want to uh, simplify these equations, we can take some where anything that's multiplied by v and basically say it's equal to 0, because that's much smaller than the u component here. Um, we also know that, uh, oops, I don't know why that du, um, oh, sorry, not, there's, there's not supposed to be anything there. Anything changing with respect to x is going to be much less than anything changing with respect to y. Um, I didn't mention this, I should have, but these boundary layers are typically very thin. They're very thin. Um, and, and for example, if you're flying in a commercial airliner, the, the boundary layer is about the width of a, 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 the thickness of a sheet of paper, right? So, uh, so the boundary layer itself is very thin. We have a lot of changes happening in the y direction, but it takes a long time for changes to happen in the, z, in the x direction. So things happen very quickly in the y direction. So d dy is going to be much, much greater than d dx. 
And so with these two with these two assumptions, essentially, that our v velocity is going to be much, much less than our u velocity, and that anything changing in x is going to change much more slowly than anything changing in y, um, we can simplify the Navier-Stokes equations into something we can solve. And these are called, by the way, lubrication um, theory. And there are whole groups of people who work on just solving different variations of uh, this simplified version of the Navier-Stokes equation. And the reason it's called lubrication theory is it's used, it was initially developed for um, like journal variants, which we've talked about, right? Where we have flow between two plates that are very close to each other, um, where you have a lot of stuff changing in one direction and not much stuff changing in another. It's, it's essentially uh, applying dimensionality like we used to apply. Okay, so with some semi-serious math, we could do it, but I don't see the utility in it right now you can develop the following relationships. We can say that delta is equal to five times the square root of nu x over u, our free stream velocity. So what this tells us is that our boundary layer grows as uh, the square root of x. So its shape looks like the square root of x, which looks something like this. Um, so this is the boundary layer thickness. Tau is the wall shear stress and tau is equal to 0 0.332 u to the three halves times the square root of rho mu over x. So this is really interesting because this tells us that our shear stress is proportional to x to the negative one half. So actually our shear stress falls like one over the square root of x. It starts off very high at the beginning of our plate and that makes sense because our you know, the beginning of our plate, our gradient is very high. See how we have a large change in velocity in a very short period of time in the y direction? our u velocity changes very quickly. So it makes sense. Our shear stress starts very high and then decreases as we go along the plate. Um, we can define a, what we call a local skin friction coefficient. Coefficient. And that's equal to tau of the wall divided by one half rho u squared. You note this looks a lot like our lift or drag coefficient just without the area, um, which makes total sense because we've already divided by our force by our area to get our shear stress at the top. And this is equal to 0 0.664 divided by our Reynolds number square rooted as a function of x. Right, so what this means is that we calculate our Reynolds number. Let's, let's say we have our plate like this, and we're a distance x away from the front of the plate. We calculate our Reynolds number there. That is our x. Our Reynolds number x is equal to rho v x over mu. So as we move along, our Reynolds number increases as we move along the plate, right? Because as our distance moves along the plate. And finally, our drag coefficient is 1.328 divided by square root of Reynolds number of the entire length, which is equal to our um, F drag. As we know, our drag coefficient has to be equal to 1 half rho u squared times the area of our plate. Um, and this is our friction drag coefficient. Um, and what we've done is we've integrated our skin friction coefficient from zero to L and um, yeah, we've integrated from zero to L and multiplied by the area. No, we didn't multiply the area, sorry. 
we, yeah, we integrated it from zero to L and divided by L. So we, since we took the average of the skin friction coefficient to get us the drag coefficient. Um, cool, so with these tools, we can now calculate our drag force or the shear stress at any point on the plate. So the shear stress at any point on the plate or the drag force on the entire plate, and we can determine the thickness of the boundary layer at any point on the plate. And we're gonna practice this real quick. Um, uh, yeah, actually we're gonna practice this in the next video. And um, what we're gonna practice on is looking at uh, like a magnet on a car, and we're also gonna look at uh, um, banners flying through the air.